Hi guys, welcome back to Biobulletin. Today, I'm joined with Kanishka and Viven, and we're going to be discussing MRSAs, a very medical heavy based topic. So make sure you listen carefully throughout the podcast. So what are MRSAs? So essentially, they're a strand of bacteria with high levels of antibiotic resistance. So that it's short for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, and they're now resistant to methicillin, amoxicillin, penicillin, oxacillin, and a few other common antibiotics. So obviously some drugs can be effective on MRSAs, but the strand is continually evolving and adapting, so gaining more resistance as it continues. Uh, it's meant to have arisen in the same way the evolution of other organisms occurred, a random mutation in a strand of bacteria. So before the bacteria can divide, it needs to make two identical copies of DNA in the chromosome, one for each cell. And every time the bacterium goes through this process, there's a chance of mutation occurs. Um, and the process is called binary fission. Some of you may have learned about it in school or biology or whatever. But um, part of the base sequence of a part of a gene within the DNA of a bacterial cell um, is altered, which leads to a different protein function or product molecule. And this causes a different function of the bacteria, basically, uh, and different features in the bacteria. So when a mutation occurs, it can either be positive or negative. Uh, and an overwhelming amount of mutations are generally negative, which means they benefit the organism in no way and so are prevented from being passed on to future bacterial generations because the cell dies prior to reproducing or going through binary fission. Um, and so the negative mutation isn't passed on. But when a mutation is positive, it naturally means it aids the cell in some way. So here the MRSA strand was initially resistant to methicillin, meaning um, it was advantageous and thus it enabled the cell to stay alive for longer. And so when genetically identical cell, uh, a, a daughter cell which is genetically identical was produced in binary fission, um, the cell carried the same trait of methicillin resistance. Uh, and it's kind of the process of survival of the fittest and natural selection going by Darwin. Um, and th like I said, when the cell undergoes binary fission, the new cell and parent cell, which are genetically ad identical, the advantageous mutation is expressed in the daughter cell. And that continues for for multiple generations until there's a whole new strand of um, bacteria with resistant to, res, resistance to antibiotics. So that's how uh, MRSA became biologically resistant to um, methicillin. But how do you actually get MRSAs now? So, like you said, MRSA results from infection bacterial stains that have become resistant to antibiotics. Uh, now MRSA is contagious and it spreads from person to person via either direct skin contact or when a person with MRSA on their hands touches an, an object and another person then handles the object, that latter transferring doesn't seem that prominent, but the bacteria can survive on surfaces for a long time. So quick question for you guys, how long do you think the bacteria could survive for on a cotton polyester blend, so a normal day-to-day -day clothes? um i don't know maybe two days three days yeah exactly up to three days but on 100 percent polyester uh i'm saying five days up to 40 days 40 whoa yeah I and on polypropene plastics that's what maybe aprons are made up of what do you um think? perhaps i don't know uh 50 over 50 days, yeah. So I, thought that, I thought that quite astonishing how long it can stay on one surface. And yeah. There must be so much spread through that as well. Um, but there are two ways the, the bacteria can spread, like I said. But there are two bigger groups. And when I say groups, I mean environments where the MRSA thrives. So there's the healthcare-associated MRSA, and it's solely people who have a compromised immune system spend time in the hospital and other healthcare facilities. It's more likely to happen in the hospital naturally. I mean, there's limited space for a lot of people, and these people with health conditions may be less able to resist infection. Uh, the other grouping is community-associated MRSA. It's everything outside the healthcare setting. That's on living with lots of people, like on campus, having skin-to-skin -skin interactions, you know? Yeah, so presumably that also applies to, like, uh, changing rooms for athletes or schools or workplaces and places like that as well. Yeah, and like old antibiotic use too. So there are naturally some symptoms. To, who knows about the symptoms? Okay, so um, having MRSA on your skin does not cause any symptoms as such and doesn't make you ill. 
you will not usually know if you have it unless you have a screening test before going into hospital. So if MRSA gets deeper into your skin, into the bloodstream, it can cause swelling, warmth, pain, and pus. If it goes even further into your body, uh, it, you, it will cause a high temperature, chills, aches and pains, dizziness, and confusion. How do you screen and test for them is my question, because obviously I've mentioned a little bit that we have to screen them before you get into hospital, but who knows about screening and testing? So when screening and testing for them, uh, it's a fluid sample that's needed, either from your wound or your nose. Um, you get those using swabs or blood or urine that is tested, either of those four. Um, sample, samples are then sent to labs for testing. Um, it takes up to about two days to get results because it takes that long to grow enough bacteria to be tested. There's no real big risk associated with the process, just the normal pain and bruising you get from your blood tests. Um, I'm just curious, does anyone know how you get treated after you know you have MRSAs? If the screening finds MRSAs on your skin, you may need treatment to remove it. This is known as decolonization, and this usually involves uh, applying antibacterial cream inside your nose three times a day for five days, washing with an antibacterial shampoo every day for five days, and changing your towel, clothes, and bedding every day during treatment. And of course, the laundry should be washed separately from other people and at a high temperature. Uh, treatment is usually normally done at home, but may be started after going into hospital if you need to be admitted quickly. So yeah, Ashish, like you said, uh, the basic routines like changing clothes, sheets and pillowcases, you have to implement those for a couple of days after the treatment. Um, you're also asked to use antibacterial creams and shampoos. The treatment itself is primarily doses of antibiotics to combat the bacteria, usually being injected or given as tablets. But when it comes to the medicines, is tetracycline uh, that's used for skin and soft tissue infections. That itself is a combination of something called rifepristin and fusidic acid um, and if there's severe infection uh, glycopeptides can be used as well but i was just curious about the spread as well how can we prevent the spread because obviously you have all this treatment and such but it doesn't eradicate the entirety of the bacteria yeah of course so what's really vital for prevention of mrs a spread is the cleaning of equipment and things which come into contact with our skin so essentially good hygiene levels um so it's only truly detrimental when it gets into your body. So using barrier methods like plasters to cover cuts and things which are like entries into your body. And if you're going into uh, an environment where it's highly likely that the bacterial strand is present, then wear maybe a mask, gloves, um, other things which cover orifices, essentially. Uh, and report any suspicious skin, skin conditions to a GP so that they can take the correct steps to prevent further spread is obviously hugely vital um but the key message is good hygiene in the sense that to get it off your skin there's no true way but to prevent it to prevent it getting on your skin you have to take necessary steps like cleaning equipment all of that stuff like i said especially in environments like we mentioned earlier schools work changing rooms places like that is vital um but to prevent uh, against mrsa is developing further resistance the key thing is to not unnecessarily take antibiotics so over-prescription and self-prescription of antibiotics has been proven to increase the likelihood of bacterial antibiotic resistance. Uh, and that leads to huge issues and greater con consequences of the bacterial spread, um, which is which needs to be avoided, avoided again, oh, sorry, prevented. So uh, to summarize, uh, it's quite an intriguing um, superbug in the sense that it's, uh, it's biologically resistant, which we haven't seen much before. Um, it's key that you prevent against it by not taking unnecessary antibiotics and see a GP or um, someone in, who can inform you the necessary steps if you do have any symptoms. Um, I think that kind of wraps it up for today's episode. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed. If you have any comments or any suggestions for future podcasts, please leave them in the Google Docs down in the description below. Please subscribe, like, and share the videos and the channel. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. See you next week. And Thank you guys. Us and follow our Twitter.